God, we give you praise. God, we give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. Amen. Do you love Jesus? Woo. You may be seated. Praise God that we have the freedom just to say his name. I like it because demons get nervous when a Christian starts talking about the, the Lord. I like that. I like making demons who tempt me nervous. The ones who torment us with lustful thoughts and desires to cheat and to steal and to let out those curse words that you probably wouldn't say around the pastor. I like making the devil nervous when I say, well, Jesus loves me. And one day, devil, you're going to bow to him on your knees and you will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So you might as well get used to it, devil. Get used to the idea because my Jesus is going to come out on the winning side. Amen. Thank you, praise team. This morning, I want to share a message that the Lord has given to me for this very hour. And I like looking at this crowd because I can already tell you, the Lord has made an appointment with somebody today at the tomb. An appointment at the tomb. My goodness, Pastor, that's a weird, weird topic. An appointment at the tomb. Now think about this, Brittany. Let's say you were a real estate agent and you wanted to meet with customers. You had some prime property and first thing you want to do was, hey, let's meet at the tomb and discuss this property that I'm trying to sell you for about $120,000. Well, a tomb is the last place you want to go impress somebody at. Amen? Let's say you're a wedding planner and you're meeting with this bride, Miranda, and you're saying, now we're going to pick out the most beautiful dress you've ever seen, but in order for me to get just the right lighting, we're going to go into the tomb and check out how this dress looks on you for your big day. That, that, that woman would be looking for another wedding planner, amen? You don't pick the tomb as the meeting place. So I ask the question, why in the world then does God set the tomb as a place of appointment with his church today? Why did God say that he wanted to make this a place of appointment? Well, we begin with Mark chapter 16. And we start with verse 1, and I'm going to be hopping, jumping back and forth between. Some of you said, you really going to be jumping, Pastor? Now, I'm known to do that. But today I'm speaking figuratively. From Scripture, we're going to be going to different Gospels, so just follow with me on the screen. Mark 16, 1 and 2. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of this week, of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. I really find this amazing. After two of the darkest days in all of history, if you were a follower of Christ, there are women going to the tomb to anoint his body. You've got men of God who are, uh, I don't really know what all they were doing, but they were huddled up in a house somewhere probably crying, probably talking about what are we going to do now. And you know what I liked about the women of God? They said, well, we're still going to serve him. The guys may have given up hope, may have thought, well, there's nothing left to hope for. No more revivals to run. Nobody else is going to be healed. But I tell you what, Peter, James, and John, this, this Mary Magdalene's heading to the tomb, and I'm going to do the only thing left I know to do. I'm going to anoint the body of Christ. So we see that God was setting up an appointment with these women. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, Salome, and any of the others that are mentioned here, they never got to go to Sunday school class, and, and I, I'm from old school. I had flannel boards. Y'all remember them? You'd put the colorful pictures on the flannel boards. And oh, I, to me, it was like Internet. Like, wow. I didn't, we didn't have Internet back then. And they had never gotten to sit in a class in Sunday school, and their teachers say, now, Jesus is going to be crucified, and then three days later, he's going to rise again. They'd never seen that acted out. They'd never watched a passion play. They'd never been to a church, and they put on a big drama, and, oh, here comes Jesus out of the tomb. No, because they were living right in the middle of the story. They were living out what you have seen portrayed in cartoons. Last night, Passion of the Christ on TV. There's, they've been showing movies. Thank God they still do that on TV. Showing movies about Christ. You just saw a, a, a drama here. Tonight, they're putting on a, a play that's just absolutely amazing a drama and please come if you can six o'clock but bottom line is they didn't have that they were living out the story and even though 
They did not have this reference of, oh, I've seen the movie. I know he's coming back. Yet they made up their minds, we're going to do the only thing left we know to do. We're going to minister to him just like we did when he was alive. So we go to Matthew 28. Now things are about to get a little violent. There was a violent, somebody turn to your neighbor and say, he said violent. Violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Isn't it amazing those people who had on the best armor, the latest weaponry, and all the authority of Rome when they came in the presence of one angel, how they reacted? I mean, here they were, the big bad soldiers. You don't mess with me. Ain't nobody touching that tomb. You're not breaking that seal. But one angel shows up and they just fall to the ground like dead men. And that just goes to show me something, that the power of God surpasses all the military might this world could muster together. Amen. They were afraid and became like dead men. Now, I don't have a lot of time this morning, so I can't get into all this, but this was actually the after show. You ever heard of an after show? You got the main event, and then you got the after show. Well, when the angel showed up, this was the after show because what had really happened that was so awesome is something that one day when we get to heaven, I hope I can watch the video. Of course, they'll probably call it something else besides video. But I want to see what happened when Jesus went in the earth, amen, and kicked the devil's rear end. <laughs> That's Michael talking. That's, that's not the Bible. Uh, let the devil know who God really was. And he took the keys, the authority, the power of death, hell, and the grave from the grasp of Satan, and the devil didn't know what hit him. He was so proud of the cross. He was probably already uh, having demons to paint crosses down there in hell. So, yeah, put, move it a little to the left right above my big screen TV. Now, we didn't, they didn't have big screen TVs on earth, but the devil might have by then. He's smart. But, you know, move it a little to the left. I want to make sure I got a cross up there because I always want to remember how I triumphed over the King of kings and Lord of lords. He ain't much now, is he, demon? But, oh, what changed when Jesus decided to step foot right in the middle of Satan's dominion and say, hey, all these folks over here in Abraham's bosom called paradise, people like Adam and Eve and Abraham and Isaac and, and all these great prophets, Isaiah and King David's over there somewhere. Hey, devil, you thought you could keep me from taking them to heaven, but my blood just paid the price. I just died in their place. Oh, devil, you thought that you had won the victory and you thought you had them right where you wanted them, but I've come to let you know, Satan, that I have have all authority given unto me by my Father, and I'm taking up those who are captive up to him. Now, that was the big show that we ain't got to see yet. But on earth, during the after show, the angel shows up, and all you've got is just one angel, rolled the stone away, sat on it, and some men that have fallen like dead men. And John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2 says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the tomb or the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. That's referring to the disciple John. And said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Now, what happened once she did this? The Bible says a lot of them didn't even believe Mary Magdalene, but there were two that went running. Their names were Peter and John, and John outran Peter, and so once they got there, John kind of stopped. He wasn't really ideal on the situation. It wasn't an ideal situation for him to walk in the tomb, so he waited on Peter, kind of like the, the guy who was God's right-hand man. He said, I'm going to let you check it out first, so Peter goes in there, and all he finds are grave clothes and then the napkin that was wrapped around Jesus' head nicely and neatly folded. And then the Bible says that John walks in and the Bible says John believed. Amen. But what happened? Well, there was nobody there. All they knew was Jesus is missing. There was no angel there at the time Peter and John came. So what did they do? They left. I'm sure they were excited, especially John, because he believed. But then we find that something very interesting took place. John, uh, verses 11 through 13, John 20, verse 11 through 13, if that's up on your screen. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. Which Mary is this? It's speaking of Mary Magdalene. <clears throat> stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? That's very interesting right there. Woman, why are you crying? Do you know that when God asks us questions or an angel asks us questions, he usually knows the answer already? 
He wasn't, this angel wasn't really wondering why she was crying. He was trying to ask her something to make her think. Do you really know why you're crying? Can you tell me right now what has, what has brought this on? I mean, here we are. There are two angels. Hey, we're putting on a show. There's a, a grave clothes. What more do you need, Mary Magdalene? And yet you're crying. And they're asking her a question because they want her to start seeing what's really going on here. Why are you crying? Here's what she said. They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. Now, I want you to put yourself in Mary Magdalene's place. That's something we like to do at this church. We, we like to get into character and go back in time and, and try to feel what they feel and smell what they smell and see what they see. And here you've got a woman who is so faithful to God that when all the disciples but John had fled, this woman, along with other women, stood at the foot of the cross and watched her Lord die. This is a woman when men are huddled up in a house and they're hopeless that she's made a decision, yet I will serve him even in death, and I will go to the tomb and anoint his body. And now we see the ultimate desecration of her God. For now, not only have they crucified him, they beat his back uh, to a point where she wonders how he even lived past the beating. They put nails in his hands and his feet. They crowned him with thorns that jabbed into his skull and caused blood to run down even into his eyes to where it was difficult to see. Once the crown of thorns were on his head, the soldiers took rods and staffs and they would hit those thorns deeper into his scalp because of beating him in the head. And now after they've done all of this, you mean to tell me that somebody's got the gall to roll the stone away and steal his body? I want you to think about what's going on in Mary Magdalene's head. She's thinking it was bad enough what they did to him when he was alive, and now I'm trying to do what's right. But when I show up at the tomb, somebody has stolen his body. What more can they do, Ben? What more? I mean, I mean, you crucify him, you kill him, world, and now you're telling me you're going to steal his body so that I can't even do the last ministry I had it in my heart to perform? She says, I don't know where that they put him. Then we go to Matthew 28, 5 through 7. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, well, that was the obvious. She knew that. But then he told her something that caused her to get on a different path. He said, he has risen. Somebody say it out loud with me. He has risen. Just in case there was any atheist in Rainbow City, I put it on my sign at Knights Floral Sutton Bridge Road. If you drive by this week, you'll see Jesus is risen. Oh, come on, somebody give him a hallelujah. <clears throat> Just in case. Somebody didn't know it. Jesus is risen. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. How important was this event in the history of all the world? It was so important that without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. Not only is there no New Haven Church of God that gets started three years ago in Southside, there would be no Southside Baptist, no Southside First Baptist, no Meadowbrook, no Rainbow City Church of God. There would be no Rainbow City First Baptist, no Heritage Baptist. There would be none of these in existence without the resurrection. There would be no United States of America that was founded on Christian principles without the resurrection. Kind of hits close to home, doesn't it? Mama would have never prayed and read her word every night without the resurrection. People could not have prayed you through when you should have died in that accident or you had a physical ailment come on your body and, and you could have died. Nobody could have interceded for you and God reached down and brought you out without the resurrection. Now there's a thought. The resurrection does indeed impact our lives. John chapter 20, verses 14 through 17. Now remember everything that's just happened. And it says at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But, there's a key word there, church. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. If there was anybody on this planet besides Mary, the mother of Jesus, that would recognize him, it was going to be Mary Magdalene. I'm telling you, this woman was faithful. She loved him as a disciple. She followed him. She worshipped him. She believed in him as the Son of God. She followed him all the way to his death on the cross. 
If anyone would have recognized him, it would have been Mary Magdalene. She was standing there when Jesus from the cross spoke these words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. She even heard him faintly say, It is finished. And then finally his last prayer, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, before I go any further about I'm not recognizing, there's something very important I need to point out, and it's found in Mark chapter 16, verse 9, because if we're not careful, we will completely miss this point about Mary Magdalene. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. Are you ready for a revelation? Mary Magdalene had a revelation from the Lord that nobody else had the moment Jesus died. Because as she stood there and Mary, the mother of Jesus, is weeping and John, the disciple, is holding Mary because Jesus has just told him that, son, behold your mother. He was saying, you need to take my mama on, John, like she's your own mother. And so he's standing there and he's realizing all the, the great responsibility he's got. But then you've got the, the woman, Mary Magdalene. And as Jesus says, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And he lets out a loud shout, breathes his last, and his head bows low. Then she watches that Roman soldier walk up to him jab his side with a spear and blood and water flow out Mary Magdalene had a revelation because you see she realized that as soon as Jesus died those seven demons did not come back oh wait a minute we're about to go somewhere now we're about to have some church See, something happened to her. She's thinking, now, wait a minute. John don't understand this. Mary, the mother of Jesus, she, she, she hasn't had my experiences. Peter's never had a devil in him that we know of. James and John were never possessed like I was. But as soon as Jesus breathed his last and I saw his head fall and I knew he was dead when they, they jabbed him with a spear, those demons have not come back. See, God was giving Mary Magdalene a revelation. That even though Jesus Christ had died, his power was not ended. Amen. Just because Jesus said it is finished, it did not mean that it gave the devil power to come back and rule her life again. Thank God Almighty that Jesus' words surpassed death. Mary Magdalene might have been the first woman to, to view him when he was resurrected, as the Bible just said. But I believe she was also the first woman to realize that Jesus' power crossed the threshold of death. And there ain't no devil that can get back in this old girl because whatever he spoke surpassed the cross. Hallelujah. See, the devil thought he killed him. The devil thought he destroyed even this work of Christianity, the church that Jesus was trying to start. But what I'm seeing is Mary Magdalene as even when he died, his power still reigns supreme over that old devil. She was beginning to get a revelation. So let's go back to John 20, 14, and we see that Mary Magdalene did not recognize Jesus Christ. How is that possible? How is it that she could not tell who he was? Let's look at verse 15. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Does that sound familiar? Sounds kind of like what the angel asked, doesn't it? Now remember, whenever the Lord or an angel asks a question, it's not that he doesn't know the answer. It's that he wants you to find something inside you that has been hidden for a while from you. You've been, you've been thinking a certain way, but you didn't want to admit it. You've been feeling a certain way, but you didn't want to tell anybody because you was ashamed. But Jesus said, I'm asking you a question because I'm going to bring something in you to the surface that must be dealt with today, Mary Magdalene. If you're ever going to make it past this act of resurrection, you've got to deal with this question. And so he speaks to her and he says, why are you crying? And then God adds, Jesus adds something that the angel could not add. He started getting deeper than the angels were into her mind. He said, who is it you are looking for? She just wanted to hear him talk about her. Oh, come on. Or, or wanted to hear her talk about him. Jesus wanted to hear Mary Magdalene talk about him. He said, why are you crying? But who is it you're looking for? thinking he was the gardener. Now, what an insult that is. You're the king of kings. You just put on the biggest show down in hell and, and paradise that's ever happened. The devils are still laying on the floor of hell because they don't even know what hit them when Jesus came. And here's a woman who don't even recognize it. Don't you know what I just did? No, he didn't come across that way. He just asked her a question, and she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him. Somebody needs to be interceding right now. Tell me where you've put him. 
and I will get him. Mary Magdalene had just seen a stone rolled away from the tomb. She had just had an encounter with angels. All right? Heard them speak to her. And yet she's still stuck in the old past. She can't get past Jesus the last time she saw him. Oh, we're about to go somewhere right here. You see, a lot of people get stuck in the past because of a way God used to move and they think he can't move any other way but the way he moved when I was a kid. Or, or maybe certain churches, they, they're just not formal enough so I can't really attend there because that's the only way God can move. Or, or they'll say, unless a church sings a type, a style of a certain type song, then God can't move. But see, what God's trying to show us, church, is that the Lord, he's not satisfied to stay stuck in the 1970s or the 1980s or 90s early 2000s. My God has been moving since before we were born. Amen. And that's why you've always got to be willing to follow in his footsteps. Mary Magdalene got so stuck in seeing Christ as a dead man that even when he stood before her in all his glory, when he stood before her a champion over death, hell, and the grave, she still asked him, do you know where they've laid him? Do you know where they've taken him? Can you tell me where you've put him? And I will get him. We've got to be careful, church of the living God, to recognize God where he is moving right now. You've got to get rid of thinking he can only move a certain way. He's only going to do a certain thing. I've got to be a certain way in my life for him to move. Get past all that junk and just say, Dear God, I'm coming with my whole heart. I don't understand all this stuff. I don't have a doctorate degree in theology. But there's one thing I know you created. I feel the Holy Ghost shift in this service. I, I, I know, God, that you put a heart in me and you gave me a conscience so I would know truth and a lie. And, Lord, when the truth was spoken, I would recognize you. See, that's what God's trying to do. He's saying, you got to stay with me. When I move, you move. When I stand still, you stand still. And Jesus was no longer on the cross or in the grave, but Mary Magdalene continued to have the mentality, I'm looking for a dead Savior. So what took place? Skip that next PowerPoint. Let's go to verse 16. Mary Magdalene had received a great revelation. She knew the power of those seven demons could not control her even through death. She had all the tools to believe. But did you know, church, sometimes you need more than a revelation. There's people in this room right now that I could go put my hand on and tell you I've heard God prophesy through people over your life. I have heard God prophesy to you about great things that are in store for you. Some of them have come to pass. Some of them have not. But did you know there comes a point in your life where you got to have more than a prophecy? Did you know that prophecy that you heard in the last two to three years has not kept you when you were in sin? It wasn't the prophecy that, that caused you to repent or caused you to be in church today. you got to have something more than a prophecy. You need something more than flipping on the TV and hearing an anointed song. Has, has anybody ever listened to a, a, a song that was so anointed of the Spirit that you had chills come all over you and sometimes you started crying? when they were singing and you were just like wow what an anointing that kind of anointing is awesome Colton but sometimes it's not enough sometimes people can come step foot in a church sit down and hear a message that they know is straight to them but when they leave and they're eating at Taco Bell or they go to Western Sizzling they're eating that baked potato Got that butter and sour cream. Everybody knows I like talking about food when I'm preaching. Now, cutting into that steak. Did you know the feeling you had while I was preaching today leaves you? Once you start eating that food, and you're just, oh, man, I love, I love this sweet tea. Glory to God. You don't think about much what the preacher said. Sometimes you need more than a preached word, an anointed song, a prophetic word spoken over your life. Sometimes you need something that I call an encounter. Oh, glory to God. Because, <laughs> see, I don't forget encounters I've had with God himself. I didn't need a man. I didn't need a woman to lay their hands on me. I didn't need somebody to preach a certain sermon. I needed an encounter with the King of kings and the Lord of lords where he stepped foot in the room and the preacher stepped to the side and he said, Hold on, Michael, I'm taking over this service and I'm going to talk to them myself. 
That's the kind of encounter that I'm talking about. When nobody's in your house and you get in your bedroom, you, you turn off the light, you got that little lamp on and, and you shut the door and, and you kneel down to pray and God himself steps foot into the room and you know it's not your flesh, it's not your imagination, it's not a dream, it's your creator who breathed you into your mother's womb, who has just stepped in the room and he's talking to you. Oh, somebody's feeling something they ain't felt in a while. Woo! I've come for an encounter, church. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. What did she do? She turned to him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. King James Version says, which means master. Jesus gave her exactly what she needed to hear. He didn't need to pop out with a thousand angels and sing an awesome song to put on a, a big front. He, he didn't need to take her back to the tomb and say, hey, let me talk to you about what I've been doing the last two and a half days. He didn't have to go through history. All he had to do was speak her name. With one word, Jesus awakened the faith of Mary Magdalene. And she knew after that, you're my master. I can't help but wonder when Jesus did this if Mary Magdalene's thoughts might have gone back to another story involving a tomb with a man named Lazarus. He'd been dead four days. Mary, which is a different Mary, Mary and Martha, they were sisters. A lot of Marys in the Bible, Ben. Mary was there and they were crying and wondering, Lord Jesus, why in the world did you take so long to get here? And when Jesus got there, you remember the Bible even says he wept. He prayed. He spoke to some men. He said, move that stone out of the way. And then he begins speaking some very powerful words. But here's what the Lord showed me this past week. When Jesus cried, and trust me, when the Lord cries, mountains can move. When the Lord cries, there's going to be a shaking in the atmosphere. But did you know when the tear fell down Jesus' face, Lazarus didn't get up? When he said his prayer to God, Lord, I, I'm not praying this because I need to. I'm praying it that they may believe that I, you have sent me, that their faith may, may be growing. I can't remember all word for word, but he was praying for the people. Did you know Lazarus didn't get out of the grave when he prayed that prayer? Even when he told those men, hey, roll that stone away, guess what? Lazarus was still dead. But when Jesus said something, everything changed in the graveyard. He said, Lazarus, come forth. He spoke his name. And there was an awakening, not because of the tears of Christ, not because the men rolled the stone away, but because the resurrection and the life who we call Jesus spoke the name of a dead person. And when the Lord who is life steps into a graveyard and calls your name, yes, I'm talking about spiritually today. When you're in a place where you don't feel hope, when you're in a place where you don't feel like you've obeyed God, when you're in a place where you wonder, will God ever use me in ministry again because I, f I feel the Holy Ghost. I've fallen so far and I've failed God, and I've repented, and every time I, I feel that good Holy Ghost, I'll get up and go about two or three weeks, and then I do the same thing over again. I've hurt my family. I've hurt my friends. I wanted to kill myself, but thank God Almighty, Jesus has made an appointment at the tomb today at New Haven Church of God, and he's walking in the building, and he's about to call your name. Glory to God Almighty. When God spoke the name of Lazarus, something changed in the graveyard. The same thing happened when he was in yet another graveyard that contained his own tomb that he had gotten out of. And Mary Magdalene heard him call her by name. It awakened something in her that surpassed her sorrow, that surpassed her broken heart. And when he spoke her name, all of hope came back to her. You have an appointment with the the tomb, at the tomb with God today. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20 and 22 says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And finally, verse, uh, John chapter 11, the second part of, uh, part of verse 25. Stand with me, please. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. You've got an appointment today. Pastor, I dressed up. I wanted to look good, show up with my family, hear some good music, watch a great drama, feel some chills, hear a good word, go and eat and be done with it. 
That would have been pretty good plans just for a regular person. But for the person who's broken, that doesn't quite get the job done. You see, my God is known as the potter. And he tells us that if you'll come down to the potter's house whoo, and you'll get up on that wheel as clay, then I will put my fingers upon you and I'll begin forming you into the vessel that you were created to be. A vessel of honor. A vessel that is no longer cracked. A vessel I can pour my anointing oil into and you won't spill everywhere because of the brokenness. But I will make you whole so that I can direct my anointing from you and you will be able to pour into others. That's what God wants to do today. I want you to close your eyes, please. Now I'm about to ask you a question that's going to shake you to the soul. Do you know him? Preacher, I've been in Sunday school. I've been in church. I know him. I've heard stories. I've read the Bible myself. I got about five of them. That ain't what I ask. I ask, do you know him? Because if you know him, then you know his voice. And for some of you who had lived, who have lived for him in the past, you've missed that voice. You've said, I don't know what it's going to take because I really don't think I can live the way God wants me to live. I don't think I've got it in me. Well, you're exactly right because without the Spirit of Christ in us, we don't have it in us. I can't live for Jesus another day if the Spirit of the Lord was not in me. But because of Him, we have victory and overcoming power. And I've got a church almost completely filled, Ben, with people who love God and are saved by the blood of Jesus and on their way to heaven. But God didn't set up an appointment at the tomb just for a bunch of good saved folks and everything's right. When God told us to start the New Haven Church of God, He's told me, Michael, there will be people who are broken. And you've got to speak my word into their lives so that they can be made whole. It's not going to be fancy lights. won't be because we got the best praise band, greatest drama team. It won't be those things. It'll be because His Word is anointed. And when His Word goes forth, it will interact with the broken soul and repair the brokenness. Amen? So here's the question. If you don't know Him the way you want to or used to, are you willing to make the choice to come to the tomb? And all your weaknesses be revealed, not to the church, but to God. He already knows. Just like when he asked a question, uh, why are you weeping? He already knew that. But there's some, some kind of power in us saying what we need. Spirit of the living God, I can't do your job. I wouldn't even attempt to. I just deliver the word. But what I'm asking of you to do right now, is that as you have set an appointment with certain individuals in the building, that you let them know I'm talking to them. That you let them know, God, that right now if they're willing, they can absolutely break free from the bondage of addiction, from the bondage of sin, the bondage of lust, from the bondages, God, that they've dealt with and they hate them. God, there's some people who are bound by despair. Seems like everything they try, it falls through. It, like almost nothing good can happen. They're not addicted, God. They're just in despair. They need a different type of healing. Lord, I pray right now you call them. Holy Spirit of the Lord, I pray you call. Touch their heart like you did when they were children. Lord, when they felt your presence and they dedicated their lives to you, Lord, when they were young and they weren't going to let anything come between you and them and yet, God, life hit them in the face like an 18-wheeler and, Lord, everything fell through that they had planned as far as serving you. But, Lord God, I pray today you let them know it's not too late. You've come to restore, to rebuild, to remake on your potter's wheel what the enemy has told them can never happen. Now, bring them to us, Lord. Bring them to the altar. In the name of Jesus, please keep your heads bowed. I've went long enough. I've spoken enough. I'm calling you right now to hurry. Hurry. Don't worry about messing up your clothes, messing up your makeup, your hair. Don't worry about what anybody thinks. The only one I'm concerned about is my Lord and what does he think about me. And if I'm willing to surrender all to him right now on this altar, 
If he smiles over me today, I could care less what anybody else thinks. I want to please God. He's the one that got out of the tomb for me. He's the one that went to a cross for me. I want to please God today. And I want to give him everything I've got today. If that's your prayer, please move fast. I can't tell you how many people need to be up here. It would shock us. Who's going to be the very first one that will bring in a flood of others? Who will be the very first one to say, Pastor, there's some brokenness in me. There's some things I need to have repaired. Who will be first? Who will be second? Who will be third? Who will be fourth? Who will be fifth? Who will be sixth? Seventh? I tell our church this all the time. If you're in a hurry, you got to go eat a hamburger. I love you. God bless you. I may not shake your hand because I'm going to be praying for some people. But if you're willing to stay at your chair, if you don't need to be up here, and you're willing to pray for these, I would be very honored. We're going to pray. Anyone who believes God can do a miracle for these up here, you are welcome to come and help me pray for these. I love you.